so I first met Samar actually when this whole business of lockdown was starting. And as with so many of the people who've been on the MEX podcast in the past, there was a bit of serendipity involved. Samar had actually heard the episode that I've recorded with Kwame Nyaning, who's the chief experience officer at the electric vehicle company uh, Arrival. And she got in touch. And one of the things which struck me straight away uh, was the breadth of experience that Samara has had in her career and how that has given her a unique perspective on some of the ways that we might think about uh, the future and the role of user-centered design in planning a, a strategy for that across a whole number of industries. Because she's worked in graphic design, she's worked in wayfinding, she's worked in architecture, she's worked across service design, digital strategy, innovation, uh, and she's worked very globally as well. Uh, the US, Saudi Arabia, China, uh, London, the Netherlands, uh, and across a whole bunch of different companies and, and consultancies. So she's worked with EY Seren, Tata Consulting, Fahrenheit 212, uh, you know, really a, a very broad and, and full range of experiences. Uh, and it's wonderful to have her on the show to be able to join us for this. So we're going to cross now to Samar for the first part. We'll have the interview 15 minutes or so. And to say, if you have a question that you'd like to ask when we get to the Q&A, do just use the raise a hand feature. I'll know you're waiting and I can then bring you in once we go to the, the Q&A section. So let's see if we can get Samar on the line now. Samar. Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome to my living room. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining me on the show. Um, now, one of the things which I'm always intrigued by on the MEX podcast, and I like to try and start off with, is to find out a little bit about where this all started for you. So when you think back, what's one of the early memories that you have of doing something creative, doing something that made you feel like a designer? Well, that's a very interesting going back. Um, I was raised in Lebanon, which um, throughout most of my childhood, we had moments like we're living right now, moments of crisis and moments of lockdown. And one of the things that uh, my parents, especially my mother, would say, you're not allowed to say you're bored. Uh, there's tons of books to read. And here's white paper and pen and pencil. How about you draw? And that's how I started getting into drawing and painting. Uh, as well as whenever we were not in lockdown, I used to do ballet. Uh, so kind of the whole blend of it between dance, music, and drawing, that I started seeing the world in um, color and movement. And movement was very important, and then how you see that in color was also very important. But then also at the same time, I was starting to see a lot of the interconnectivity. No, no thing lives in isolation. Um, you had one event, let's say, the war was breaking or a ceasefire was breaking and the ripple effect of that was way beyond just where it was breaking. So it was an interesting connection of ideas and things that probably didn't start making sense until later. So that's I, I, I remember when we were talking before we set up this interview and you know, moving on from those early creative experiences, you were telling me that you felt that the first part of your career, really the first sort of 10 years or so, um, mm -hmm. were a time when you got into the idea of, of design, but more from an individual perspective. You know, what you described, I think, to me as, as a tactical perspective. Yeah. Um, what did user-centered design mean to you back then? I had studied, uh, well, I started my studies in, first in architecture and then shifted to graphic design. 
And in both those disciplines, we were being taught in a sort of Bauhausian way about the experience design, about the um, product design, as well as uh, visual design, as well as architecture, which is kind of a product. Then you, as you're thinking about it, 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 it becomes about, uh, you're looking at the individual and their experience with that product or service that, uh, that we're designing. And the first part of my career started actually blending the two between graphic design and um, architecture, and I started working in wayfinding. Now the big question, the reason why I ended up in wayfinding is, looking at what we were studying in graphic design and architecture, my big question was, well, we're studying the products, but how do we humanize the world? And that was a very big question that led me to my final year product, uh, project, that led me to um, where I did my internship in New York, and that led me to find uh, to the move I did to Amsterdam to work in wayfinding. That was the first main question, humanizing the world, but I was looking at it from, um, uh, from an individual perspective. The two, there's a key, uh, several key books that I read around the time that influenced my thinking because of what we were talking about just earlier, that the emergence from the days of being in lockdown and being in the war, I, I was thinking of how can I respond to that? And some of the um, uh, thinking were accessibility and access by design, as well as design for the real world by Papanek. These two, uh, these two books were good, great triggers of my imagination, but also a book by Shemetov, um, the planner for Mitterrand, which was 20,000 words for the city. And that also expanded my understanding of how words and the experience at the city uh, of the city can become at an individual level versus the uh, uh, the, the plan that we're drawing on uh, on paper. So I took these ideas and started my career in first wayfinding, um, where in wayfinding you're trying to resolve issues that architecture didn't quite resolve to experience the built environment. And that is what the role of wayfinding is. And, uh, and you see a lot of it in solutions like signage or maps. But that started to get me to question. So um, at that point, I had first done my internship in New York, then moved to Amsterdam. So I had already started blending cultural understandings. And when I was in uh, Amsterdam there, it was the very Dutch Germanic way of thinking that it's Dutch design, it's very much um, a preset solution. And I was questioning that because the experience that we individuals live at in, within the built environment is very much cultural, but the solution was not. And it didn't stand well with me that, why are we creating one standard fitting solution that got us to understand the built environment in a linear way from point A to point B. What were some of the places where you were applying that expertise in wayfinding, you know, in terms of the, the industries or the particular built environments where you were starting to apply that way of thinking about design? Well, the first very interesting project I did was the eye hospital in Rotterdam where I understood that there is a shift in what the hospital is becoming. Um, and it is about understanding the, vis the visual and how people understood how, how they see. And that's all what the eye hospital was about. So I started exploring how do we share that, how do we play around with that and use that to navigate. And interestingly, the ideas that um, I started exploring back in 2000 were very recently put in, um, I think it was a Harvard Business Review, as this is how you bring design thinking to uh, hospital design. And that was not, design thinking was not even on our radars back then. We were trying to experiment. After the eye hospital, I got involved in our longstanding project with, um, um, with the Schiphol Airport. And right around that time, we had 9-11. So the standard ideas of what we had in um, building a wayfinding system in, a, in an airport were completely challenged by all the security aspects of, uh, that were added 
to the, the airport experience, but also um, the fear factor, the, which is something with that, just as a side note, this is exactly what we're going to be f facing right now in the opening up post-pandemic. The moment you, you have that shift in models from one reality to the next, you're going to have to shift behaviors and shift understanding because we, we, um, everything we kind of knew ends up being challenged by the fear of our unknown. And it's pretty interesting, I mean, to have an unexpected spanner thrown into the works like that, an, a, a formative stage in a project, which uh, at that time, yeah, you were talking about 9-11, but I can certainly see the comparisons with <laughs> the situation that we, we have today. Um, I mean, thinking back to that, how did that actually change what you were doing on a practical level day to day with the project? How did you have to start to adapt your thinking at that point to, to go beyond, I suppose, what you may have described earlier as that more sort of individually led experience to thinking about how it fit into all of those wider implications of, you know, the, the regulatory regulations, uh, the, uh, the security implications of the whole thing? Well, at the time, we were still being at the far end of the regulatory. We were being rec receivers rather than shapers of regulation. Um, when I was working on the, um, the Schiphol Airport project, we didn't have a hand in shaping the regulation. But the, the advantage of the way the Schiphol, um, Schiphol Group operated and how we were able to work with them is that they were very collaborative. So. When 9-11 when happened, all projects came to a freezing point. And because I kind of had already uh, in my mindset, you don't sit still, back to what my mother were, was teaching me at a young age, you don't sit still, you, you kind of think through what you're doing, whether it is with pen and paper or with uh, reading through it. I stood back and I was like, what can we do with this situation? So I came up with the thinking of how do we blend a lot of um, experiences from the world of leisure that had already previously been done to be able to alleviate the pressure of the, the fear factor of all these regulations being imposed on us and created this idea of building a mascot that would take you through the journey of um, uh, of going through the travel, as well as give you timelines and time frames and what to do in case of what. Um, now, that didn't get quite implemented, but a lot of these ideas then found their way into um, map design in Schiphol, which I took on afterwards, or took their way, uh, they found their way into, like, on, on most signs, then you start seeing what's your walking distance from a certain point. These were originally ideas explored with a mascot on after 9-11 because the lines, uh, waiting lines were becoming so long and stress was becoming a problem. So what you start exploring right after a crisis doesn't necessarily have to apply as they are. They shape your vision of where to go next and because they challenge what you knew. So it enables you to challenge things. So after Schiphol, we were working on um, the airports in um, JFK and LaGuardia, that stopped, but we were able to explore the same ideas into train stations and railway stations or in hospitals and ex or in museums. But these were still the individual uh, experience on an individual level. It wasn't after Amsterdam, I moved to Chicago and being within an architecture firm, we had the opportunity to step a bit further down the line into the design process of the architecture rather than responding to it. And that, that's the reason I went into architecture, uh, in an architecture firm, because to me, I didn't want to be solving a problem that was created earlier. I wanted to help shape it from the get-go. So I went the step uh, towards where I thought the decision was being made, an architecture firm. Now, I, I want to um, try and open up to some questions in a moment, Smarba, but just before we do that, what, one thing which I wanted to ask you about um, that, that shift to architecture and starting to take that sort of slightly mm -hmm. more expansive uh, thinking about what you could achieve as a designer. Um, this was back in still the, the early, mid 2000s sort of time period, but what five, yeah. was, was digital starting to play at that point? 
Oh, very early. Digital was very expensive at the time. Uh, at the time, so for example, when we were exploring digital uh, usage of uh, in wayfinding, we had to look at usage of beacons and RFID. Uh, so that meant um, you had to supply uh, uh, pro not a product specifically, but um, something in the hands of the user as well as something in the hands of the uh, uh, on the on this the sign itself or in the building it could not be accessed by everyone it be, it was sort of an elite uh, elite experience because it was very expensive and not every airport was willing to do that museums were a bit especially the private museums so when we were exploring uh, digital it was more with the private entities rather than the public entities. It wasn't until um, around 2007, 2008, when I started working on the Princess Nuda University that Facebook started. And we still weren't working in the cloud per se, but smartphones had started finding their ways into more ubiquitous uh, hands in a way. So we were able to think on a broader scale. And when, when I started working on the Princess Noura University, which is a whole university uh, for women in Saudi Arabia, that's when I was able to pull things a bit further down the line and looking at the whole experience um, and building a strategy that will enable um, breaking the silos and building the experiment, experiment or the experience in all different parts of the the space, whether it is working with the curriculum writers or the food suppliers or um, the interior and uh, the wayfinding team and the architecture, of course, and all of that. And here, here digital started playing a bit of a role of the connector in between these things. Because um, in the Princess Noura, we also had the problem of women the world of Saudi Arabia and women had not opened back then. So we had a lot of problems of, we're building a university where there's not enough uh, professors to come and teach. So we had to think of technological uh, solutions. And a lot of the things that we're seeing today with the online learning that has happened due to the pandemic, we were exploring back then. But in one way, um, conversations or, um, in other means of technology that will enable the learning without breaking uh, cultural norms. Very but interesting. Um, now, I would like to, to open it up, Samar, to see if we have some uh, additional... Uh, <laughs> sorry, let me finish the thought because it's an important thought. We knew we were able to do that because when we were studying the user in Saudi, the women of Saudi were forefront of using technology because that was enabling them to challenge social norms. So that's always important where culture is your, uh, your key to behaviors. So Very interesting indeed. No, no, that's some, um, yeah, an interesting uh, additional perspective on that. Um, now I'm gonna open it up and invite everyone who would like to ask a question to use the raise hand feature so we can bring in some additional perspectives on this. But um, while people do that and we see um, who's gonna have the first question, um, I, I just wanted to follow up on that because I think that that is a very interesting perspective you brought in on that and ask whether that, because that expanded role of technology you were seeing at that point was giving you hope then, is that hope amplified for you today in terms of what role that might play in connecting between these systems as we emerge from the pandemic? Well, I, it is, there is a hope, but at the same time, there is a challenge. Um, we've seen a lot of emergence, even pre-pandemic, of uh, the talk around digital transformation. But I would, what I've seen as studies is around 85% of these digital transformations have failed. And there's a reason for that failure because we're applying the, the, um, the technology or whatever technology it is or, or the solution before understanding the context and the, uh, the the situation and the who and the why basically 
And until we start understanding the who and the why, the how is going to be irrelevant. It's going to fail. And that's exactly what I was trying to say with the Saudi women. They were the ones who gave us the solutions by their own behaviors, rather than us imposing solutions on them. And that doesn't mean that they, it is something that they already were doing and we're just following up on that. But the indications that you see through behaviors and culture is what leads you to know what will work within a system. And that is very key uh, because when you're trying to build a future and a transformation, you have to bring in that human-centric approach is bringing in behavior and culture, connecting it with system thinking to be able to reach the goal that you're trying to achieve or the purpose or the vision of your organization. And that is what's missing in most digital transformations. What we're seeing is more of a rollout and implementation um, and it's a hit and miss. All right, well, let's see if we have any questions from our participants. If you'd like to ask a question of Samar, all you need to do is uh, use the raise hand feature um, on Zoom, and then I can bring you into the conversation to ask that. Um, I have the, the luxury of having Samar all to myself at the moment, I have plenty more questions to, to fire at her. But if you would like to, to ask a question, then do feel free to um, put up your hand and then I can uh, bring you into the, the, the conversation. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm going to carry, uh, carry on while we wait for um, additional questions. You can use that raise hand feature at any point during the conversation to um, put a, a question to Samar and I can bring you into the, the discussion. Um, otherwise, as I say, I will continue in the luxurious position of being able to <laughs> ask all the questions that, that I want to ask. Um, so, Samar, you've obviously had the opportunity to work across lots of different geographies, lots of different teams, and you were talking there about your experiences in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, and the, um, I, I guess one of the things which I wonder about that is whether you've been able to identify some of the hallmarks of a, uh, a successful um, team, one that is able to interpret and understand those trends in user behavior and then start to take some collective systemic action off the back of that of all the different teams that you've worked with over the years have you have you i've been able to identify the cultural factors the process factors which make teams good at doing that yeah uh, i have you know in a way it is the teams that are the most in between worlds are the most able to imagine what is um, a different kind of world. Um, so by that, I mean people who have sh shifted careers uh, or have moved from, um, uh, throughout their careers, moved from one discipline to another, uh, people who have traveled, because you're, by doing that, or a combination of all of that as well, and, uh, and uh, by traveled, I don't just mean you went to, visit uh, on, as a tourist, which does help, but living in a different place is, is what enables you to cross from being a tourist to uh, embracing and understanding different cultures and different behaviors. And the more you're in between worlds, the more you can actually see what are the uh, values of the things that we have already and what are the things we need to shed and, and release. And that is where, um, and it's the same within disciplines because that's the problem what we see in most disciplines. We end up with a with talk about problem solving. And problem solving is usually from the perspective of your discipline. You start solving, let's say there's congestion on the road. Uh, if you ask a traffic engineer, the solution would be wider roads. And if you ask a transport engineer, you'd, they'd say put more buses or trams or whatever on, on the road. Their solution is going to be from their perspective. And that is, to, it fits the saying that to every hammer, the world is nails, uh, is filled with nails. But if you have, if you are, let's say a traffic engineer that shifted to become, 
I don't know, I'm going to throw it out like a, sh uh, a chef, then your mind is uh, completely moved away from my solution is, has to be this. You're going to think maybe the solution has to do with access to food or access to, you know, the, it's that blending of worlds where innovation comes from. And the most successful teams in being able to reshape models and systems are the in-between teams in a way. Yes, that diversity, I think, of, uh, of thinking is absolutely vital to teams you know really across all industries in, in being yeah. able to do that to to see the connections between things to see the implications of it now um i see we do have a, a question here from uh craig stevenson in the chat um let me see if uh craig would like to ask this directly otherwise um i can put it to him from the the chat we'll just see if we can bring uh craig in Craig, hello. Are you there? Would you like to ask your question directly to Samar? Hey, Samar. I'm just asking about, uh, can you explain more about bringing culture into the systems design, uh, people and cultures into systems design? Because otherwise it can be kind of, uh, I guess, uh, static. And of course. And that is, uh, that is one of the key things. In, in order to be able to understand the cultures, we need to do some sort of ethnographic studies and, and immersion and under, uh, but that is uh, that doesn't all only help us uh, because it's still detached so we need to look at uh, what are the different needs and what are the different um, wants as well we don't we shouldn't be all about just factual needs it's, it, it's the wants and, need, and needs from a different culture would enable us to see where these guys are uh, wanting to go. Otherwise, we're flattening the world by creating uniform systems. And that is, up till now, the difference between the physical environment versus the digital environment. Digital has been built with a no, on a tabula rasa in a way. So we're able to build a system that we are supposing will fit everyone. Uh, so the digital world has been more or less flat whereby the physical world has been much more diverse and, and um, culturally diverse. But then we've got a move towards um, flattening the world in, a, in, a, in globalization and modernization. And it is now a a very important to bring back um, that cultural perspective and the behavioral perspective in order to shape where the future is going to go. And we've seen the problem emerge in responses such as the pandemic that we have today. But in order to do that, we need to be able to take that perspective that we usually get to see through what we call design thinking approach, but we need to take it to top levels, into decision-making uh, levels, whether it is uh, government or C-suite or strategic um, level conversations. Because it is not about the, uh, this is where we shift from being designing for individual solely to designing for a collective when we take that to that level and take the understanding that is cultural and behavioral to where the decisions are being made we can bring back uh, that diversity into the systems rather than creating um, sort of stripped down systems and that is one of the problems we're seeing today because we've created systems that are um, supposedly lean and efficient, but efficiency has removed all that diversity. We need to be looking at effectiveness, and effectiveness is bringing a quality of life and um, um, a, a sense that is relevant. And that's where culture and behavior come into play. That's a, a very interesting differentiation there, Samar, between the idea of, of efficiency versus effectiveness. I mean, when you think about some of the projects that you've been involved in over the years, um, are there examples that you can remember where you feel that you were able to build that difference into the, the project? 
Um, you talked a little bit about the, the Princess Nura University there. I don't know if that was one which um, where, where you saw that in effect or if there are others where you were able to, uh, I guess, give yourself enough um, uh, enough latency within the system mm. to, to be able to support that kind of differentiation. Well, the Princess Nura, like many of the projects we work on when we're in the design world, um, the decision has already been made of what you were trying to do. So um, that means that you're working towards a, 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 a preset quantifiable vision. Um, we try to reverse that as much as possible through our user-centric approach, but that still didn't mean that we went all the way or that we were able to implement all the way. But when you're doing something completely new and different, you are you push to a very high level and you're happy with a 10, 20% um, move forward. And that's, that's, the, uh, that's how things uh, do happen in the, in the world of business in a way. You have to push the vision very high, but you have to take into account there's still a lot of barriers to be overcome in order to achieve those visions. Um, and Princess Nuda was still in very experimental models uh, that we were playing around with. And the fact that design thinking and all that was not co commodified yet, exploring was something we could do without anyone raising their hand and say, that's not what design thinking is about. The commodifying of uh, approaches, it is to our detriment. And it then sits the barriers of, well, this is how design thinking should be done. Well, why? Um, exploring should be able to bring in many different things together. Now, in order to be able to do, to answer uh, what you were saying, is there a place where it, we were being, uh, we were able to be the most effective? It was the projects that later on I was able to do with, um, with consultancies and management consultancies where we were able to work directly with top leadership on project now they would come to us with a question that is usually much more defined as in uh, we want to build a platform um, but then when you start asking the questions why are you trying to build a platform you understand the question is much broader of what is the future of my industry i am being disrupted as an industry by um, the newcomers and the digital incumbents and no, not incumbents, sorry, wrong word, uh, digital uh, newcomers. And that's where you realize one question leads you to a much bigger, um, broader question. And the more that leadership allows you to explore that broader question and explore where that's going to go and then enable their team to have that capability to question and break the silos, that's the most efficient and effective way of moving forward into the future. Because efficient means then you're building a partnership with your clients where you're not just going around in circles around the same question. It be, and effective, it's because it becomes a, that partnership leads to them having the ability to cross their own borders and borders between them and their clients. And these kinds of uh, projects have ranged from working with governments, be it in Saudi or uh, sometimes here in the UK, or working with uh, uh, top tier management consultants and uh, the big four and all of these guys. And that means when, when you have that engagement from the, the top levels in these organizations, the, the rest of the organization will follow and uh, they'll be enabled to work with you. Because otherwise, the people within organizations are being pulled in two different directions. On one hand, um, a project that's talking about innovation and moving into the future. On the other hand, their day-to-day -day and their um, rewards and checks and balances systems within their organization, which forces them to stick to their own silos. And there's a conflict that um, then ends up on the individual themselves. And since their bonuses and their salaries are reliant on the existing reward system, 
they stop being able to engage with the innovation part. And that's a very big reason where we see digital engagement failing, why we see innovation engagement failing. It is that siloing within organization and the non empowering from top levels to do this kinds of um, exploration. One of the things I wanted to pick up on there, Samar, is, is you mentioned, um, or I think it is a really important part of, of any of these projects, that idea of the level at which they are commissioned and the sort of engagement that you're getting within the organization right up, as you say, to the, the most senior management. Um, but something which I've got a feeling might be familiar to quite a few of the people uh, who are, are tuning in for this is uh, as that sort of seniority of engagement increases, how you get uh, the people in senior management um, to actually remain connected to the reality of what it's like for their customers and their users on the ground as the project takes on significance and as the project starts to become more expensive. And I'm wondering if you've had any experiences of trying to resolve that tension, you know, if you like keeping on the one hand the, the macro view, the sort of systemic thinking view going and making sure that change is happening at a large scale while making sure that it doesn't diverge too far from the reality of the, the user's experience on the ground? Well, every organization and every team, a leadership team is different. So part of the first, uh, to be able to do that is understanding that team and their realities and their day to day. And that's part of the exploration. Um, and, in, and having to, when you understand them, you can see then how much they're going to be willing to be engaged. And that is, uh, very relevant to see how, how it's going to work uh, in the long term. Because without direct engagement and conversations with the CEO and the board uh, or the chairman or whomever are the decision makers, the rest will fall into those uh, sidelines. But in order to be able to get their attention and keep their attention, you have to engage them as well within the, dis, the continuous design uh, decision making and to do that by understanding them then you can quantify the quanti uh, the qualitative that you're trying to achieve so engaging the uh, top leadership is how we can shape the vision and the strategy which is based on a collective purpose but to all that becomes fluff unless we have a way to measure it. And it differs from one organization to the next, what is important to them and how they measure it. But unless we start with measuring and quantifying the qualitative, we're not going to be able to shift the mindsets to that qualitative transformation within the organization. Because if it isn't quantifiable, then there's, um, you cannot put value to it. And at the end of the day, that C-suite and the board have to uh, need to find some sort of measurement and value that they will be able to be reporting on. But if it is not, um, if it if it does not have that quantitative um, to the qualitative, you're not going to be able to create impact. Does that kind of? It does, yeah. I think that's a, a vital balance for, for any of those um, those kind of projects. And I mean, if I may, I wanted to ask a, a bit of a question about how this has fitted into you know your your career and your personal experience of all of this. Because some of the projects that you've described are obviously a pretty diverse and the, mm -hmm. where you've gained these experiences, these insights from across different geographies, across different industries. Um, how do you come across these things? I mean, how did you end up, for instance, working on this huge new university that was being built in, in Saudi Arabia? You know, how do you, how do you get to that point where you find yourself um, in the, uh, in that kind of role? Well, to, one of the things that I also noticed is to be able to be in these kinds of positions, you have these, uh, or to be able to tackle such, great projects, they, uh, you need to be within the right organization. And not necessarily 
the organization is getting them all the time, but they have the potential to. Uh, and the organization that's willing to explore and grow with you. And some of it was, ha um, ha not haphazard, um, by chance that I ended up one place and then I saw the potential and I'm like, okay, let's go for it. And some of it was by plan, like going to China. Um, I ended up in Chicago by, by chance, seriously, because I got to, uh, got to know the, 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 the company that owned the company that I was ending up working with in Chicago. But in China, it was much more of a planned uh, move to go to China with another architecture firm. And coming here to the UK, it was much more of networking and finding the right places. But it is, a, in order to be able to achieve these great uh, kind of projects, you have to be in a place where they might come. You're not going to be able to um, solve something at a scale if you're talking at a very small scale. You, you need to, I, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but in a way, if you build it, you will, they will come. You know that saying? You have to be where they will come. But doesn't mean when they come to you that they, they will have the right question. It is also being able to open up that question and it becomes an iterative and re, uh, growing exploration together. So finding the place that will in, enable that exploration on one hand, so that you can have that team to grow and build, as well as the kind of clients then will come to you because you're doing that and vice versa. I guess it shines a light on that idea of the, the curious mind and the desire for, for conversation and expansive thinking as being one of those core skills, whatever aspect of, of design that you're, you're involved with. Um, now, I want to I, make sure... I'm a Sorry, I feel like I'm a five-year-old who never grew out of the, asking the question why. <laughs> well, that, that is a pretty good discipline to keep with you throughout your career, I would think. Yeah. Um, now, I want to make sure we have time so that everyone um, who would like to, to ask a question of you has, has time to do so. Um, also, if any of you have a view that you'd like to offer on this core question that we sort of set as the theme for this, this idea of... Um, which of the systems that support our way of life have you become more aware of during the pandemic and how do you think that we could change them for the better with the principles of user-centered design um, if you have a question on that or you have a view on that theme or another question you'd like to put to samar then do please raise your hand make yourself known and i can bring you into the conversation um, to do that uh, as i mentioned before i um, I'm very much enjoying the privilege of being able to put all these questions to Samar myself, uh, but um, do feel free. We have about another 10 minutes remaining during which um, we're very happy to take questions. Um, so I'll wait to see any raised hands uh, or comments in the chat that people would like to ask a question and I can bring you in. I see we have one here from Julie Kennedy. Let me see if I can bring her into the conversation. Uh, Julie. Um, hi, hi, Samar. Thank you. Um, really interesting, fun, fascinating career and range of um, countries and places you've worked. It's really interesting. Um, I guess I guess I'm linking this a bit back to, to Marek's question as well around, um, you know, what have we noticed? How what systems can be improved? And and then, and I think what's really stood out for me is um, designing for older people. And mm -hmm. I've, you know, this has been a bit of a pet topic of mine in the, in the past. I've talked a, lo a little bit about it and researched it a bit. And um, I, I think that's become evident even more now that or particularly in time of lockdown and, and older people are particularly isolated, where they've relied on, say, grandchildren or their children to help them set up devices and things. They're now having to do that on their own you know i've i've done that with with my own my my own dad who's 89 years old and you know he's finally got to round to using facetime the right way around now you know we're not looking at a fruit bowl anymore so, um, so that's good but it took a lot of telephone conversations to, to actually enable him to do that so i'm i'm just wondering what 
your perspective is on and Marek's as well anyone else is about how we we can bring that how we can improve that really going forward and also have you encountered anything similar to that in your sort of career before really thank well yes uh, thank you Julie for that and yes there is definitely when you're uh, I've encountered that on a in the physical environment when we were working in um, uh, so access by design was a very big thing uh, in terms of designing the, uh, the physical environment, especially in the US, it was mandated by what was known as the ADA requirements, the Americans Disabilities Act. But that came about through lobbying from the war veterans returning. And so they were trying to get access to people with disabilities. Now, there was a following movement to that, which is access by design to everyone. The, to me, there, uh, the requirements of the ADA might have helped in the isolation part, because the way the ADA, the, trying to create universal access has in some ways, for example, when we put the ramp, instead of putting it in the front end of the building, we end up putting it on the side, isolating access to uh, somebody in a wheelchair to go to the side and have a different experience than that of somebody who can go up the stairs or access the main part of the building. Now, that is how, in terms of buildings, we somewhat isolated people with different abilities. But in terms of systems, also, that part of siloing has led us to, to build, uh, remove our, uh, put our lives into buckets. So when we're in, uh, and, and the way we've continued to build our systems in our cities have, have um, propagated, what's the right word? Um, continued spreading that same, um, siloing. So when we have our education system is now removed from our um, uh, retirement homes, uh, removed from the business centers, that means that whenever there's a lockdown like we are living in today, those systems break on, so lock into each other, uh, away from each other and in this case, we're having the elderly have completely been separated from the rest of the society because they, we designed them out of it. And that is one of the challenges that we need to bring back into our way of designing uh, our systems, invisible and visible, so our cities as well as our um, business um, models to be much more universally access, accessible. And that changes the mindset of, it's not about equality, but it, about equity. And if we're talking about equality, then we say, well, they have the same, um, they have the same access, but equity is equal access in a way that all of us experience uh, are able to access things in the same way. So what we need to shift our mindsets into the future that we're designing uh, post-pandemic is how do we create that equity of access within whether it's digital worlds or whether it is in the, the way we're designing the way we live. Now, I think we have time for um, perhaps one or two more questions. If anyone else um, would like to put up a virtual hand, I can bring you into the conversation to, to ask your uh, your different questions. Um, but one thing which I guess for me comes out of uh, that, that observation there from Julie um, and also Samar's response is um, that sense of, of interconnectedness and perhaps I guess what you could call sort of ripple effects that um, for every group that you do or don't design for, um, there ends up sometimes being unintended consequences and, and that sort mm -hmm. of concept, if you like, of, of making space within your practice, within the project, within the work that you're doing as a team to, to trace those ripples and see where they go, whether it's during the active part of the project itself or maybe even some way down the line um, to go back and investigate what were the things that happened that you didn't expect, um, whichever yeah. group of, of needs it is you're designing for, because those are the things that as a designer uh, you, can't, you can't perhaps um, predict. Uh, 
Um, so yes, do feel free to to raise a hand if you have a, another question that you would like to um, bring in for Samar. We have a, a few minutes remaining within the discussion, um, and it'd be great to get some more views from different people from um, all over the world, I can see here, who have uh, tuned in from this, which is great. Lots of different uh, geographies and countries represented in the, the discussion. But yeah, feel free to, to put a hand up um, and ask, otherwise I will continue to hog the questions and, and make the most <laughs> of this time um, that we have together. Um, one thing I, I always like to ask, Samar, um, mm -hmm. despite the fact you've had an enviable range of different projects you've had the opportunity to work on, is there anything you haven't yet had a chance to have a go at that you're really hoping that you will get to work on in the future? Any particular industry, any particular type of project? Uh, in a way, yes, because even though I've worked across most range of projects, we haven't really always taken it to the levels that are um, interesting and the where we can really do systemic changes. So it isn't. Uh, I would. One of the things that is of great interest to me is, for example, looking at um, rethinking what's the future of mobility and how is that going to change the way we live. And by mobility, I think about not just a mode of transportation, but being able to move and what is that going to give us as access. And that interconnects then with the world of digital and interconnects with the world of the physical environment and how does that differ within different cultures. Same thing with redefining the models of healthcare. And instead of looking at healthcare, looking at what is the, uh, how is the world of well-being and um, good lifestyle is going to be in the future and how does that blend into then the transportation and mobility versus the education versus so those are the kinds of things that I uh, would be very interested to explore where there's an interconnectivity and a ripple. And you see um, that being very starkly put into, uh, into or spotlight with something that like what we're living in today where one moment was able to shatter a lot of our systems. And that moment was somebody trading or buying a, a wild animal in Wuhan. So then the butterfly effect ended up shutting the global economy. And we always think about uh, action, uh, there's to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But that Newtonian thinking doesn't really apply where things are ex can grow exponentially. And what I would like to explore is how can we do that? How can we work within a human-centric system that can grow exponentially and have a positive impact on an, in an exponential way and um, across multiple systems? Because most of the time when system thinking is applied, it's applied within a layered approach. But it is where now we're seeing that ecosystems collide, and I'm interested to explore how these ecosystems do collide, whether it is user ecosystems or the physical and virtual ecosystems around them. Well, I think particularly if you get the opportunity to work in areas of travel and healthcare, you're going to find um, industries which are, you know, really quite ripe for disruption now. I see we have one final question here from Brittany Beckett. Um, I'm going to try and bring her into the, the conversation. Let's um, see if we can get her on the line. Brittany. Hello. How's everyone? Hello, Brittany. Thanks for taking my question, Merrick. Um, I'm based in Ireland, but obviously I have a New Jersey accent coming in. Um, so my question was around building your own brand and how design plays a role in that. Well, depends what you define as design in this case, because are you talking just the visual aspect of it or are you talking about designing what the, your brand in its entirety means? And you can use the same approach that you would use to design 
the visual, visible visual aspects of your brand to all of it. Uh, the brand is the, um, to me, brand includes culture, the culture you bring in, uh, what, what defines you as a person and what defines the, um, what you bring to the world. And that is, can be by design or by serendipity, but you can design through serendipity as well. So I think I'm talking a bit abstract here, uh, but designing your brand doesn't necessarily just need to be in type and color and um, touch points. There's way more than the, the direct touch points where brand can manifest itself. And those are definitely designable, uh, but not usually. And uh, if I can take my brand, so to speak, my own brand, uh, the, the whole story of my life and my journey and what I stand for and what I bring to the table is definitely my brand. And some of it came by design and some of it came by looking, having hindsight 2020. Uh, it is how, to, uh, how you tell your story and extract what you want to achieve through the story you're trying to tell. Well, Samar, um, I'm very grateful to you for coming on the show today and sharing some of that story and, and sharing a bit about your brand. I think that's all we're going to have um, time for for now. But, you know, really, thank you for taking the time to come and do this. And I wish you um, all the best with finding those meaty, uh, holistic projects to get your teeth into in the future. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone who took the time to uh, join us on this uh, live webinar. It's, uh, it was exciting to be the guinea pig in this, this instance. Uh, and thank you for having me share my story. You're very welcome. So, um, thank you to everyone for uh, coming along and joining for this first edition. Um, I'd like to think that this isn't actually the, the end of this conversation, but rather um, the beginning. And this is something that we can continue. So one of the things which I'm going to do is send around an email after this, which will have a link to the recording um, in case that's something you want to catch up on or share with someone who couldn't be here. But there'll also be a link there to um, a blog post with a comment section where we can um, continue the conversation. If anyone's got any views on what they heard today or on that core question that we had at the beginning, um, that would be a great place to get those all together and, and share them with everyone else. So um, I will make sure that that link is in there so everyone can follow up on that. Um, I'm also hoping that this is going to be the first of many of these, uh, these live streams in the future. Um, but that's something which we do need your help with. Um, what we're hoping to do is to use a, a patron model to support these. Um, so there'll be a link in that email too, where if you're able to make a donation to support future Mex live streams and help those happen, then that would be very greatly appreciated. Similarly, if the company that uh, you work for is interested in uh, sponsoring or um, looking at how we can do some of these for you in-house, then very happy to talk about that too. Just drop me an email and it would be great to have that conversation. Uh, but thank you again all for joining. Thank you to Samar. Uh, I will look forward to seeing you again soon on another one of these. But for now, goodbye.